Good afternoon. It's a real pleasure to have the opportunity to show you the medical library museum that we've developed here at the Geisinger Commonwealth Medical School. Uh, we did it after studying for over a hundred years worth of literature uh, with the history of the area and everyone felt that it's important to link with the past. And Luzerne County had one of the earliest displays in the United States on medical artifacts. And they put their exhibit away when they lost their building about 20 years ago and were kind enough to send us up a significant part of that display. And that sort of formed the nidus of the artifacts you will see. The individuals that we highlight, however, were extracted from this long, proud history that we've had, trying to isolate some of the more outstanding physicians who we have had in our presence. The, to start with, uh, I would like to point out to my right, uh, the uh, first physician I think of note is a Dr. Troop. Now, he supposedly had the first house in Scranton, north of Lackawanna River. He came in in the 1840s on the invitation of the Scranton family and really was the first physician and a lot of other first, uh, including opening up the first pharmacy. But I don't want to go into too much detail, but just say he did a lot for the area. I thought one of the most interesting things that he did were actually twofold. One was the military. The Civil War broke out, and he was asked to help with the Pennsylvania, northeastern Pennsylvania, namely Lackawanna, 600 volunteer troops who were active at Antietam. And he went down and tried to help with casualties and got the idea of forming the first military field hospital ever in the United States, and he did it. The other thing he did back in those days, in the late 1800s, even early 1900s, we didn't have antibiotics. And very high infant mortality, and milk was considered a panacea. And there was no access to it up here for the miners and the miners' kids. He started a farm, actually bought a herd, started a farm, in an area which is now appropriately named Troop, Pennsylvania. He obtained money for the first hospital in the area. So he was a major contributor. Uh, the other gentleman I would like to mention, uh, a very early gentleman, is Dr. Taylor. Dr. Taylor was an extremely erudite physician, and I could say that because I've read his papers. And he's a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania. He settled in Wilkesboro, Pennsylvania. Basically, he was an ENT specialist. But he had a profound interest, I believe, in the classics when you read anything that he wrote or said, but also in medical history. And put together in 1915 the display you're seeing today. And in that display, he collected a lot of major artifacts, I think. For instance, there's a saw that was used on the battlefield, Civil War. There are instrument kits that were put together at that time. And he put this all together, had a display in Wilkesboro that was taken down. When we started this project up here, we contacted Luzerne County Medical Society and say, do you have anything from Dr. Taylor? And they did. And they sent up a box, and in the box, part of the packing material, was a short letter. And our library staff was trying to discern who sent the letter, and they asked me to take a look at it. The letter is dated 1917, but the big thing is the letter is from Oxford, England. And at that time, the number one physician in the world was Sir William Osler. This letter, with his scribbling on the bottom, was sent by Dr. Osler to Dr. Taylor, congratulating him on starting 
what in some areas I read was the oldest display in the country, but whether it is or is not, I'm not sure, but it certainly is one of the oldest. And that's the center that we use with the instruments that he had procured. And we have a copy of Dr. Osler's letter in the showcase. So we're very proud of that. The other physicians that we highlighted, Dr. Stanley Dudrick is a world famous surgeon who invented a thing called hyperalimentation, put in English. It means you could not drink or eat and be sustained through intravenous feedings. He did that on three little dogs, and we have one of the uh, mock-ups of the dog, there were beagles. And they grew as with their contemporary dogs in the, from the same litter to the same extent as the dogs who were fed normally. And that opened up the whole idea of hyperalimentation. Putting it, that in English, it is estimated that he has saved 11 million lives through this find and has been rated as one of the top 25 doctors in world history. And Dr. Dudrick is a member of our faculty here at the medical school, and we're very, very proud and thankful to him. The other, uh, there are several interesting, I think, parts of the display uh, below Dr. Dudrick, so to speak. Uh, there is a operative scene and a picture of Dr. John Gibbon. Dr. Gibbon in 1953 did the first open heart surgery after 27 years of research in developing what we now know as the heart lung machine. And we have several area connections to this first operation. Dr. Nealon, Thomas Nealon, is from the Mid Valley, and I believe he's a University of Scranton graduate, uh, was the main assistant. And the intern on the case was Dr. Victor Greco, from Drums, Pennsylvania, also a University of Scranton graduate, who assisted on the case, and he is the one who gave me this information. Now, in the display, you will see the original operative note minus the name of the patient. She apparently was very humble and shy and didn't want publicity. But after the surgery was over, and what Dr. Gibbon did was close the congenital heart defect she went on to a normal lifespan and worked in the medical field. In addition to the above, I just want to mention in particular two. One is Dr. Robert Wright, and many of you are familiar with the now famous Wright Center, which has 70-some residents, and it's a huge educational uh, endeavor that Dr. Wright thought of and sponsored. And in addition to that, Dr. Wright's from here, Archibald, Pennsylvania, is a University of Scranton graduate, and he is the one who really should be given the major credit for the medical school. He was the first the CEO, the first president, he's been dean, he's been everything in the medical school, and we're very proud of him, incidentally, and very thankful for his efforts. Uh, we also have one that's kind of my favorite that nobody's ever heard of, and it's Edward Ryan. Now, Edward Ryan was a true character. He was born in South Scranton. He is not a University of Scranton graduate, but he did go to Fordham. And he finished prior to World War I as a physician. And he heard that there was a Mexican Revolution and they were holding American citizens. And somehow he volunteered to go down to have them released. Well, for his efforts, he was arrested, convicted to be shot before a firing squad. The legend is they took him out five times and shot him blanks. And President Wilson heard about it, intervened, and sprung our man, who then decided when Sarajevo happened with Archduke Ferdinand, when he was assassinated in Sar Sarajevo, he immediately went over and joined the army over there to organize their medical corps. He did so many things, I'm not going to, uh, I can't possibly fit them in, but. Just a fascinating, fascinating guy. I think you would say it was a contemporary Walter Reed, whom everybody has heard of. And I think the reason we haven't heard much about him was he died in his mid-30s. He was over in Tehran. They had an epidemic of typhus, I believe. And he came down with malaria and died at a young age before he wrote his book. 
I would just like to mention one special part of the display for the University of Scranton, but what we have is Dr. Terrence Sweeney, who is full professor and chair of biology at the university, has done what I think is a brilliant thing. Being a cardiologist myself, I appreciate it more, but he has developed a model of the entire human circulatory system. And it's over at the university, and he works with a physician, a PhD, sorry, that we have, Dr. David Averill, and we're using it periodically as part of the teaching model that we have here at our school in addition to what's done at the University of Scranton. But it's just such a unique thing that he did and was gracious enough to provide material for us to use here. And we're thankful for that too. In fact, we're thankful to a lot of people. The final thing I would say is when we started this project, the thing that amazed me was the cooperation of everybody. Almost everybody had a, an uncle or a grandfather who was a doctor who had stuff in their attic. And we literally had a deluge of very, very, very interesting artifacts. We cannot possibly display them all. But we have, I think, selected out some of the key ones. And you're invited to come to the display at any time. Thank you.